Hello and welcome to this video. Okay, this is long, long awaited what I'm about to talk about. So Fergie has released her sophomore studio album, Double Duchess. It came out this past Friday. And I have quite a few things to say about this. I first want to address the fact that this is a little bit different from a lot of other kind of artists that I've reviewed so far on this channel. Um, Fergie is definitely more in the sort of hip hop mainstream pop scene. And I, you know, have been reviewing a lot of artists that are kind of less mainstream and a little bit more classically inspired. I do love pop music. And I just want to say from the get go that this isn't necessarily indicative of a specific taste that I've been withholding from sharing on this channel. I'm sort of talking about how artists like Fergie and other artists like Britney Spears and Katy Perry, they're, they're kind of like guilty pleasures of mine. You know, I'm an, I'm an artist and I'm supposed to like, you know, all these indie alternative artists and stuff that have to have like all of this aura of abstraction around them that aren't supposed to be like easily accessible to the casual listener. But I've always rebelled against that. And so I have a deep seated respect and love for really good pop music, like top 40 hits that just like get in your ear and just really give you that feeling of like having a good time. And I also really appreciate production when it's done really well on pop, pop efforts. Fergie is a little bit more in the hip hop territory and Fergie's an interesting artist. She kind of, well, she was in the Black Eyed Peas, but she was also in a girl group before that. And she was sort of put into this sort of more urban, you know, contemporary sort of scene with the Black Eyed Peas where, and she, she was the only Caucasian member. And, you know, she remembers feeling a bit like she was in the wrong, in the wrong lane for, you know, people were doubting her because, you know, she was in the Black Eyed Peas and they were like, who's this white girl who's infiltrating this, this black group? Like what's going on? Is she really a good rapper? Like, what is the deal? The truth of the matter is, is that Fergie is one of the few, what I would call, white, you know, crossover artists who I do feel actually somewhat deserves to rap, deserves to, you know, and this is a little controversial, but possibly deserves to sort of dip her feet into black culture. There's a lot of controversy around artists like Iggy Azalea, what Miley Cyrus did many year, few years ago. Um, and now what Katy Perry's kind of doing. And of course, also a girl artist like Fergie for being white women who are appropriating black culture and just using it to sell records, but then go back to their lily white suburb, suburban life. And in every respect, you know, their money is white, you know, that sort of thing. Like they might play the black girl card, but they're actually, you know, lily white. And that sort of thing, I can so understand the sort of hesitance of, you know, um, urban listeners to fully embrace for, you know, I watched a review online where it was like all of these like hip hop fans and they were just like listening to the album and they loved the first few songs. You know, they thought they were so hard. They liked Fergie trying to spit bars, but then the rest of it, you know, it wasn't for their demographic. The truth of the matter is, is that Fergie is a genre vendor. She's one of those amazing multi-talented artist who first of all has a phenomenal singing voice and phenomenal vocal range. It's kind of something that I kind of forgot because we can remember on The Duchess, Big Girls Don't Cry and songs like oh, Finally, like they really showcase her tre tremendous vocal power and we forget that, you know, we think that like, you know, she's not actually a great vocalist like some of these other pop stars, but she really is. And so this album showcases that beautifully. And what this album really is, is like she described in an interview once, a cornucopia of different flavors and sounds and things that inspired her. Ultimately though, this is a very personal and much kind of darker album than I think The Duchess was. I heard in an interview, it was really well put that this album is actually sort of better as a whole than The Duchess was, but the singles are not as strong as the singles from The Duchess. I mean, who cannot remember the iconic hit or bop as, which I grudgingly sort of admit to in, in allowing to my vocabulary, um, Fergalicious, what that song was for mainstream, for pop music. I mean, one could argue that she paved the way for likes of Iggy Azalea. It's... It's, I, you know, there's, there's some groundbreaking ter territory there. And of course she was working with Will I Am, 
um, as a you know solo artist before, and she now works with him again on this album. And of course, they collaborate for the Black Eyed Peas. So there's already the sound that she's built upon, but she explores the sound and sort of, in some ways, tries a little bit to reinvent it, but also steer away from it and be a little bit more personal. She talks about how there was so many emotions she's accumulated. Let's not forget that this is 11 years later. You know, so much has happened. Now, she didn't really start working on this album until about four years ago, around the birth of her son, Axel Jack, who was also featured on the record. And I think what is a very kind of cute homage. And the fact of the matter is, is that she had a lot of feelings to express. She had a lot of circumstantial kind of experiences that needed to be dealt with in an artistic way that she felt she couldn't do on a Black Eyed Peas record. So this was the perfect avenue for her. Now, of course, let's not address the elephant of the room. Why did it take 11 years? This album does feel, and unfortunately, even I have to admit, it does feel overdue. The lead single off of this album, L.A. Love, La La, featuring YG, was released three years ago, almost exactly to this day. Three years ago. I mean, when do you have an album come out and the lead single precedes it by three years? That's very, very rare. And the fact of the matter is, is that it made even worse by the fact that when she released the second single, Milf Money, in July of 2016, that was still over a year before the album would actually surface. The span of this promotion was just mind-boggling. At the time, she also teased the album with the Hungry trailer. I mean, she teased a music video well over a year before it was actually released. I mean, you knew this video was filmed a long time ago. Finally, at the end of this month, after so much expect speculation and so much confusion as to the rollout of this album, I mean, it technically kind of leaked over the summer, but she didn't say a thing about it. The album has apparently been planned to come out this fall ever since she signed to her own label, Duchess Music, and Duchess Music. Back in the um, spring, she had parted ways from Interscope, which was probably a good move for her and was probably what was causing some tension between album releases and why it never actually came to fruition, even though she kept saying it would. Finally, we had the release of the pre-order. We had the release of the song Hungry and You Already Know, which is sort of the fourth single on the album. Let's not forget that back in November of last year, the third single was released, Life Goes On, which is actually one of my favorite songs and one of the most underappreciated Fergie singles I think there ever was. Because Milf Money didn't do so well on the charts. It basically flopped. And I think it was a little embarrassing because it was released in a style that had all these big names in it like Kim Kardashian, Chrissy Teigen, Amber Valletta. It had all these big names and it was meant to be like Fergalicious 2.0, not just in sound, but in its commercial impact. And it didn't necessarily deliver that. Don't get me wrong, the video has a lot of views, but the song didn't impact radio like I think they expected it to. And it really did kind of make, I mean, if the album was supposed to come out soon after that, maybe it would have helped album sales but it really did not help that that song was released with so little backing of like what's actually going on. When's the album coming out? Like the hype was kind of mismanaged, I think, in a really poor way. Whereas Life Goes On, although that song also was commercially not well received, in fact, it probably did even worse than Milf Money, that song to me was actually so much more impactful. The replay value of that song was huge. That song was actually really got me interested in this record. And then, of course, I do love L.A. Love, but it was so long ago that we heard it that I'd kind of forgotten about the song. And I was really shocked when the track list was revealed that this song was actually included. Now, I will get into talking about the album, but I just have to discuss the backstory of this because it is tremendous just how long this took to come to fruition. And it's a tricky, it's a tricky situation. She kind of cornered herself this way. I appreciate that Fergie decided to make a music video for every song because she decided at some point, I think early this year, that, you know, people are already mad at her for not releasing the record. She wants to make it worth something. So she decided to just film a video for every single song. I totally think that was a smart move. Albeit she's not in every single video and also... <sighs> You know, the fact that it leaked and the fact that that wasn't handled that well, all of these things, and the fact that, again, she was still coming off of such a long album pre preparation cycle just made this really hurt her chart impact. And as I can tell as I'm filming this, it's number nine on iTunes as of Sunday, two days after it was released. That's, of course, for general albums. It was at number one on the pop albums chart on Friday, and it did reach number one in countries like Brazil, which... 
you know, is a huge fan base for her. So she's still getting love for this record, but it's not, you know, necessarily going to get a number one spot. And I'm hoping it makes top five in Billboard. We'll see. I don't know what the first week sales are going to be, but to be perfectly honest, I'm pretty concerned because, you know, people just, people are like, literally, you can just have it. I don't care. Like, this has just been such a mess. I've heard the leaks already. I, for one, I will tell you this. I did not listen to any of the leaks. Did not. Maybe it's because I'm not that desperate of a Fergie fan that I didn't. Because trust me, if there are other artists that if their stuff leaked, I would be too tempted to listen to it. I am not Fergie's number one fan by any means. I haven't actually even heard every single song off the Duchess album. I've only really heard the lead singles and stuff. But I definitely loved those singles and songs. And I definitely appreciate Fergie's sound. And this album I have definitely heard the whole thing of and I'm actually quite a fan of. So finally, I'm going to get into this record. Um, I am also going to talk about the visuals as well for most of the songs because I do think they help you understand some of the songs as well because I have seen the visuals and I do think that they, for the most part, were very well done. Although, Fergie fans, you need to be warned, she's not in every single music video. And I know there's one video in particular that a lot of Fergie fans were upset about that she didn't film herself in and felt that was a little bit lazy but I mean you know you're filming 13 music videos so first off let's dive right into this we have the song Hungry featuring Rick Ross I already talked about how this song was teased back in June of 2016 let that sink in the video was finally released literally like 14 months later 14 months after you know, a teaser was posted of the music video and the song. And let me tell you, when I first heard this teaser, this was really what got me interested on this record. This is definitely a hip hop, you know, uh, urban sound for her. I mean, she's featuring Rick Ross. I mean, how much more hip hop can you get? It's definitely a dark sound. This is like dark, edgy, almost punk, Fergie going like no holds barred. She's just literally coming for blood. This has a very confidence about it that I really admire and appreciate. I think it opens up the album beautifully. I'm very intrigued by the sampling because I have not actually heard or read a single review that has picked up on this, but I listened to this song and I listened to Papua New Guinea by the Future Sound of London, who is a British underground electronic group who makes like electronic ambient music. And this song, Papua New Guinea, was released in the early 90s. And if you listen to that song, and I, I seriously, I recommend you look this song up, the sampling is from this song. It definitely is. Unless that song is sampling something else from before it, I highly doubt it. But the choral of vocal sample is definitely straight off of this song, Papua New Guinea, which is so left field for a mainstream pop music. I mean, don't get me wrong. Hip hop does sample some obscure samples and sounds from different artists. And Future Sound of Loveland, to be honest, that Papua New Guinea song is actually pretty well known in the kind of indie electronic world, maybe even a little bit in the hip hop world. So it's a fitting sample. And I just, I never actually like heard anyone talk about that, but that is definitely where that sample is from. And it is gorgeous and it fits so well. I think it's altered a little bit to not sound directly like it, but it's where they pulled it from. So anyway, I just, I really, really love that sample. It's a great song to lead you into the sort of vibe of this album. It is a darker album in that it's dealing with heavier subject matter. It doesn't necessarily mean that every song is gonna sound really dark but it will be dealing with personal stuff. And I think this is a good intro. And I mean, she, again, she's saying I'm hungry, not thirsty, but hungry. The next song, Like It Ain't Nothing, this is straight off of the Duchess sound. This is her going full hip hop, full braggadocious, full, you know, in your face, loud, kind of obnoxious, but in a good way, party girl kind of music. And I really admire it for that. You know, it has a nice sa piano sample. I can't remember where it's from, but I know it is sampled from something. I mean, again, tons of samples on this record. But it's a really fun song. The music video is fun. It was filmed in London. She's just sort of like being like, she's just being straight gangster. And it feels actually authentic. I don't know. It's not like for me, it's something hip hop listeners are going to really love. Because she definitely has the best raps, I think, on the album on this song. And I think that although the subject matter is very, like, I don't want to say childish, but it's it's immature. You know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a song you would sing when you're a little inebriated and you are also kind of power hungry and you're trying to, you know, outwrap somebody else. You know, and it also is trying to be just a fun pop song. So I give it props for that. By no means is it my favorite song on this record. But, you know, hey, it, it goes for what it's going after. And it's drawing you into the sound of her. And it is drawing in urban listeners. 
The next song, though, you already know, featuring Nicki Minaj, which was released as the now fourth single off this record, which I think is getting moderate at radio play. Um, it's definitely a song that I could see doing pretty well. It's just unfortunate that it also leaked and that this song has also been performed live years ago. I mean, it's such an old song. Not to mention, it is a throwback sound. This song straight up features It Takes Two. No, it doesn't even try to hide it. I mean, everyone knows that that song. So it just samples it so beautifully. And then Fergie and both Nikki, they complement each other so well with their raps. Nikki's actually pretty refined in this rap, though. She's, you know, a little bit more kind of composed. <laughs> Not if that's the way you could consider Nikki. She can be very composed. Whereas Fergie sort of really just lets go. You can hear it in her voice that she is just trying to, she's just trying to get something really off her chest and she's trying to really have a fun time. It's a really good song. The, the, the chorus is a little bit, you know, it takes a little bit to get used to and I'm not sure necessarily how I feel about the chorus. The high vocals are a little bit disconcerting at times and it does get a little repetitive, but I do love the, um, the interlude at the end of the song, which is of course not in the single version, where she starts doing these interludes throughout the album that sort of ambiently sort of set the tone for the next part of the record. It works really well with some nice jazz sort of influences. Then we come to Just Like You. This song evokes artists like Rihanna and Sia with this very Sia-like sound in the background. Very hip-hop sounding at the same time. It's like a hip-hop with a strong beat, but a vocal acrobatic kind of song. It's a beautiful song. She's talking about being tainted just like her ex. Look what you made me do, she says. Of course, it was re recorded long before Taylor Swift's new song. So, Taylor, you can't come at her for copyright. Um, I'm crazy now. Like, I'm tainted. I'm, I'm, I'm going for vengeance just like you were for me. Like, are you happy now? Look what you did to me. One cannot, of course, not think about this record in the context of her recent news of her splitting from Josh Duhamel who was her husband for like eight years and they had to have a child together. And they just recently announced that they had separated months ago. A lot of these songs can be direct. You know, she doesn't explicitly state this, but you directly can know that these are about Dumel and about the, the disintegration of their relationship. The next song, A Little Work. Boy, do I have to talk, and I have to talk about this song's music video because the music video adds so much more life to this song. On the surface, this song is a little bit of a, I don't want to say it's a little bit of a vanilla pop song, but it definitely has like, it's not as experimental in sound. It doesn't have a lot going on with the production. The chorus gets a little bit like, I love the vocals that she performs. The melody is strong, but then that, huh, huh, huh. I don't know. It feels a little too last minute. Or, it is sort of tying in sort of like a story time kind of narrative into the sound of this song. She's telling a story pretty autobiographically about what I can understand that this one time where she was literally so bogged down from drug use, from abusive relationships, from what have you. And she went to a church and she found herself again. She cleansed herself of her demons and she found that little girl inside of her. And she said, I'm going to be okay now. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to have a family. I'm going to have a child. I need to bring love back into my life. We're all, we're all broken from something. Oh, we're all fragile and we have wounds half open, she sings. But we all can use a little work to fix and mend ourselves. Do not ever give up hope, no matter how dark things get. The message is so relatable. It's so powerful. It sort of encapsulates, I think, the bulk of this sort of emotional stuff that she wanted to put out in this record. This song kind of centers a lot of that existential and kind of spiritual almost under like frustrations with her own self. And so I definitely can relate to the song. The music video is so beautifully shot by Jonas Ackerland, who is an amazing uh, director. And there's some amazing costumes and sets. It's a little bit Lady Gaga, but it's it's in done in good taste. It's It's got a lot going on and it is played through like this fairy tale or this story, this darker story that she's trying to portray of how she overcame these demons. And so we transition then into a very lighter song on this album that's like a breath of fresh air or like a deep breath. This album was, this song was actually released the week that Donald Trump was elected president. I don't know if it was necessarily planned to be that, but it was released that week nonetheless. And it's called Life Goes On. 
this song has been out for a while and it's really the one song that has had so much replay value for me from all the singles that she's released up to this point, like I said. It's got some tropical sounds to it. It's a lighter sort of EDM sound. It's one of the two songs that goes in a bit more of an EDM direction instead of an urban um, hip hop sound. And I'm definitely, I'm definitely in love with it. I think it works really well. I love the freestyle rap form that she has towards the end of the song where it breaks down. Because it shows that this song is mature. This is, you know, this is a Fergie who's a mother now. This is a Fergie who's in her 40s. But she still has, she's still here to have fun. She's still playful with her delivery. But she's, she's progressed, I think, in a beautiful way. And I think this song illustrates it that way. Again, some people might think it's a little vanilla. But, you know, again, if you're looking for straight hip hop and edgy stuff, not every song is going to deliver that for you. The next song, Milf Money. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this song, but it came out a while ago. We know the music video. Um, it's not Moms I'd Like to, you know, as she claims, although, of course, she definitely left that up for interpretation. It's actually Moms I'd Like to Follow. And in her interpretation, she's trying to, and I can tell that she's kind of, I don't know if she's a little embarrassed, but she definitely was, like, admitting that it's a silly song and that, in fact, the video is ten times more silly and outrageous, you know, with the milk pouring over Kim Kardashian and all of these things. It, it definitely, I don't want to say it, it was too much, but it was a little cringy, to be completely honest, considering especially that this is a mom who has a child. Although, again, that's the point. She's talking about moms looking good who've had children. However, she was talking about like it, how there was, even though it was like a dominatrix figure, she is playing a teacher in one scene, so you need to respect women who are teachers. She has a character, Amber Valletta plays a mayor, so women who are politicians. She has some yoga stuff going on, and she was talking about her one friend who's a yoga instructor. And she, so she's kind of, I think, kind of after the fact, kind of going back into the music video and talking about, like, there's some real deep meanings to some of these in, in, inclusions and stuff. And I, uh, I don't know. I think she's a little bit grabbing at straws because, to be completely honest, this is kind of like, I mean, it is Fergalicious 2.0. But the trouble is, is that this song doesn't necessarily know where to draw the line. And I don't know, it's it's kind of like softcore porn music in that regard. And I do admire the fact that she does break down with her voice and goes full Christina Aguilera sorts of towards the bridge. That is impressive. Albeit, you know, the meaning of the song kind of eclipses everything else and makes it kind of hard to take the whole song seriously. But hey, it's not a song that wants to take itself too seriously. Unless you try and after the fact, try and point out all of these subtle sort of actual serious things, then it comes off as a little bit desperate. Then we come to Save It Till Morning. I really was excited to talk about this song because I am in love with it. This is definitely Big Girls Don't Cry 2.0, as many people have pointed out. It has a nice sort of simple guitar melody, but she goes off full vocal range, beautiful melody, beautiful soaring vocals, with a message that is reflective and sort of very kind of like, let's work this out. Like, let's figure out how to clear this storm. She's singing about how in a relationship, you often fight, you know, in the evenings and you say things that you don't mean. She even says in the song, why do we say that? Why do we hurt the people we love so hard, so, so horribly? You know, we say all these horrible things. We don't actually mean them. We could pretend all night that we're enemies. But if we just go to sleep on this, we wake up and save it till the morning. The sun will be shining. Things will be so much better. And it's a really important message for anyone going through a relationship that might have hit the rocks. And I can't help again, I'm sure with Josh Dumel, there's a lot of stuff that she put onto this record influenced by experiences that she's had with him. And oh my gosh, I love the realist. I love just the realism of it. You know, it's, it's not sugarcoating it. The music video is actually very well portrayed. It's She's embodying this character called Phoenix, who's this woman who got signed to this label by her then love interest. And so she portrays herself as this media starlet who has to put on a face as though she loves the relationship in front of the cameras, but behind the scenes at home, she's really not happy. And she doesn't like how these things always come up to the surface, especially at night and they get into these fights and he gets so aggressive. And maybe they might have things like hate sex and stuff like she doesn't want things to be like that. She wants unity and she wants clarity of thought. And she wants this to match her persona that she's giving out to the rest of the world. So she's trying to figure all this out. And it's a beautiful song. One of my favorite songs on the record. 
I have to be perfectly honest, if I had to recommend one song you listen to, whether you're a Fergie fan or not, you should listen to this song because I definitely could see it playing on the radio. I mean, Big Girls Don't Cry was huge and it still is everywhere. That song is playing at your local Walmart right this instant. I can guarantee it. Like it is always playing in some superstore. So, you know, or restaurant. So this song is almost 10 times even stronger for me. Although Big Girls Don't Cry is an iconic song. It's beautiful. It's heartfelt. It's amazing. It's so well done. This song is not trying to be that. It's just trying to take it to the next level. Okay, then we come to Enchanté, Karine, which is a song featuring her four-year-old son, Axel Jack, which is so, at first I was like, what? You know, she's not the first artist to include their child's vocalizations in their songs. Beyonce's done it, Adele's done it, tons have done it. But this time she actually even gives him a publishing credit because he actually opens the song singing. The song is really fun. It's silly, it's playful, it's innocent. It's sort of geared a little, I don't want to say it's geared towards children, but the fact that it includes a child gives it that childlike innocence. And I'm glad that he's included because it doesn't feel too forced or weird. I think, you know, she was really trying to make a tribute to her son. She does love him so much. And why not include him on the song? I mean, it has like a little bit more adult themes at one point, but that's all kind of subtext that you have to read into. It's not overt, like, you know, other songs on the album. It's really cute. It's just going off of how it's exciting when you meet someone, possibly at a bar or at a dance or a club, and you just want to live in this moment. And to be perfectly honest, I'm a little bit tired of the hi, how are yous, you know, how are you doing, excited to meet you sort of stuff, like the small talk. But this song is sort of like an ode to that, you know, enchanté, comment allez-vous, très bien, merci et vous. You know, how are you? Like, are you doing good? Like, it's just, you know, this is conversations we have over and over and over again. The music video is stars Kendall Jenner, which I was really actually kind of impressed to see. Um, I love Kendall. She's my favorite Kardashian slash Jenner. I think she has a really good head on her shoulders. And I really relate to her with the anxiety stuff that she's been going on. But anyway, this is a different, that's a tangent. I really like Kendall. Um, and obviously this song feels very... Paris and it feels very New York Fashion Week. So of course feature a huge prominent international model superstar to show off all these amazing clothes and be on these amazing sets. Some people find found the video a little bit dizzying because it is a lot of jump cuts. I mean this is like the most jump cuts you could probably ever see. This is like this is like a daily life remix into some sort of photographic dizzying array of posing which is very artistic but doesn't necessarily come off to everyone very pleasurably. For me, it works. I've seen a lot of videos done like this, and it doesn't dizzy me. I don't know if maybe I have just certain ways of seeing things. This kind of stuff doesn't give me, like, that kind of headache. But it is very jumpy. But I love all the outfits. I love all the different Kendalls sort of just going about her daily life in this nice little set. It's, it's cute, and it's innocent, and it's not trying to make it more than it is, which I think makes the video very fun. And I don't mind that Fergie's not in this video. However, the next song, Tension, Oh Lord, did the gay boy in me, my jaw disattached from my, like, like my skull. This is a B.O.P. This is like, oh, this song is just so good. It is straight out of like Eurodance house with a little bit of disco thrown in there. Type music from like, oh my gosh, I don't know. It just, this song just makes me want to like, throw down so hard in like Amsterdam. It's just, it's a really fun dance song. And it's a little bit different from the sounds of any of the other songs on the record. But then again, like she said, this album is so varied sonically. The music video is a little bit disappointing. It just basically features a bunch of girls at a rave, just sort of with some fun photography. It's a nice video, but it could have been done a little bit more theatrically. But, you know, hey, I can understand budget's always a concern. You know, you're filming 13 music videos. Anyway, I highly recommend Tension if you like dance pop music, just in general. If you, oh my God, it's just, this song will make you sweat. That's all I have to say. Then we come to LA Love, La La, featuring YG. This song, like I already said, was released so long ago. The one good thing is that I actually hadn't listened to this song in like a good two years until I saw that track list. And started listening to it again and I actually kind of feel like I'm listening to it for the first time all over again. So it almost helps in that regard. 
it is a fun song. It's got a hip hop beat. Again, hip hop lovers will like it. It's got tropical sound. YG is featured. So it's an ode to California. It's an ode to the West Coast. But she's also name dropping all these places all over the world, like Ibiza, Jamaica, London, Paris, Stockholm, uh, India, like all these places that she's been, Johannesburg. It's, it's like a fun international, you know, again, cornucopia of sound and culture. And I, it's a really fun song. And yet it's still a little bit a little bit frisky. It's, it's very Fergie Ferg. So it fits in her style. And it was a good song to intro into the album, albeit it was just so freaking long ago. But hey, that's what it is. The next song, Love is Blind. You know, I'm not a big fan of reggae. I, I do like island sounds, but this is straight up reggae music. This song is catchy as hell. At first I was like, what? But then I was like, no, I get this. The lyrics really take a bit of time to dissect because at first, you know, you listen to it and you're like, okay, it's called Love is Blind. So you think that it's sort of like going to be this love song, but it's like a love song, but it's a double-edged sword kind of love song. It's like saying, baby, why don't you lie to me? You know, why don't you just keep treating me like crap? And if you look at the music video, it's actually very artistically done. Again, she doesn't feature in it. It's actually stop motion. Now, you know how long that takes to film. Stop motion takes forever. So we might have to blame the fact that this album is at least one whole year late, possibly longer, on the fact that Love is Blind, the video was probably made. To be honest, it just, it stop motion takes forever. But anyway, it um it's stop motion where she's this like puppet doll and she's, you know, in this pool and she's putting men's heads onto different things to sort of talk about how men who treat her wrong are just going to become furniture to her. You know, she's not going to be affected. Like, she's not going to, you know, it's like this double-edged sword thing. If you treat me like crap, you get what's coming to you. But I'll still love you, right? Because love is blind. Love sees past all this BS, right? Well, think again. So she's being, she's being ironic with most of the lyrics in this song, in my understanding. And she's being like, she's poking fun at exes. She's, I mean, again, there's Josh Dumel. I don't know necessarily what he thinks about listening to this song considering their situation but anyway might be a little bit awkward but it's a really fun song and the stop motion is really brilliant I mean it's it's cute it, it fits the song so well I actually am really glad she chose to do these like play stop motion figures because it's simple you know and it's trying to make something that's very complex and it's meaning just like simple real I don't know how else to say it but give the song a try it's it's pure reggae and it does have like a breezy feel, so it has an island scent, island feel. Um, it kind of reminds me of this one song. Um, I'm gonna be your number one. I heard it all the time at the place where I worked. And it's like, it has a similar chorus. So I just, I always hear that with these like, you know, Hawaiian sounding like um, singers, just sort of like with a beat, like, I don't know, with a tropical sound. Anyway. The next and final song on this record is called Love is Pain. When I saw this title, I immediately was expecting something raw and real to the fullest extent. I am so glad she ends the album with this song. This song is so different from everything else on their album. This is an 80s power rock ballad. I mean, this has an electric guitar solo. This has her doing the most screechy sort of like David Bowie-esque vocals that you probably have ever heard from her. But it sounds so iconic in its sound. The, the production is so full and rich. The pain in her voice is so palpable, you know, and so kind of comforting. But at the same time, you feel the pain. You feel the hurt in her voice. And you have this picture of this broken woman who's, you know, in her 40s like she is and who's thought love was going to be something but learned that it's actually all of this pain and suffering and you have to learn to overcome it to truly find the light. You don't know how it feels to be me. Wish you could feel it. You could never survive this burning, fever growing inside, a shell that you call a body. What have you done to us? You know, when I'm most insecure, you bring me down further. I could never live up to perfect. Just when I've had enough, your views change. Love fills me up. It's fire we're playing with. And I'm like a moth attracted to the flame. One day when you wake up missing me, I hope you go insane. Because pain is love and love is pain. 
And when they all act like crazy, you will appreciate me because no one else will love you more and take the pain from your thoughts. And when the world is falling, baby, I'll let you crawl in when you can love me all the way. Pain is love and love is pain. My, my, my take from this song is her saying, love is never something that just stays in one form. It, form, it morphs and changes in a relationship. And it always brings a darkness to it when you have to really try and make it work for the long term. People get really hurt. And I think that, you know, acknowledging that and accepting it, knowing the storm will pass, you know, she acknowledges that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. If pain is love, love is pain. They're the same thing. So let's not fight this. You know, let's not treat pain as the enemy. Let's accept that this is something we have to work on. You know, you drive me insane. I can't stop thinking about you, but you're literally killing me with all you're doing to me, the you know way you treat me or all of these things. But if we can communicate, we can overcome this. And even if we do split up, love will never fully die. Love will always be there. And it'll always be there to lift you up again after the high and dark, after the darkness. So it's a really dark song, but it expresses itself so well and so clearly. I, I really admire Fergie for this sound. It's, it's a sound that really puts her, and it ends the album on a very powerful, you know, thought-provoking note. And I think that's what Double Duchess is really was trying to do. I think it was trying to sort of play with the listener a little bit you know it draws you in with hip-hop then it sort of tells you about some really dark emotional stuff in the middle it talks about overcoming that gets playful again but experimental and then takes you back in and says do you have you know this is life this is how love and relationships work and i'm going to process and reflect on this and and grow from it and i hope you will too in your own life for me, it's again, Love is Pain is one of the highlight songs in this record. I do think Save It Till Morning is, sounds nicer, but it's because I'm just like a genre thing. I'm not as so into alternative rock, which is definitely what Love is Pain is. The music video is so beautiful. She's basically just artistically putting herself in this painful sort of expression of just like, oh, I love you, but it hurts me so much. You know, I have to let you go. I have to... I have to, you know, drown myself in this pain to, to put up with this. And at some point, you know, we have to learn to let go. And the visuals for the whole album, I think, are, when they're done well, are done really, really well. And again, you know, I don't blame her for not showing up necessarily in every video, although it would have been nice for tension. All in all, you know, I have a lot to say. I mean... I'm curious to know what you guys think. I don't know if, you know, a lot of Fergie fans are necessarily going to be attracted to my channel because I don't necessarily review a lot of mainstream hip-hop sort of stuff. But I will in the future, you know, there's always going to be some artists that I'm going to pull out that are going to be a little bit left field. And that's because my music taste is very different. And I, I do really like some female rappers. I mean, I'm definitely a Nicki Minaj fan to a certain extent. So, um... Be prepared for possibly some Nicki Minaj reviews because I do draw a little bit of that comparison. Um, I see some comparisons in this album to the pink print in terms of sonic um, variation and experimentation, but also with like autobiographical expressions of emotion and pain mixed in with like really, really bad, but they're good pop songs. Um, so I, I wanted to just make that comparison, but, um, I'm interested to know what you guys think. And, you know, all in all, I think it was worth the wait. I think that I'm glad that she made it a visual experience. And I think that, you know, she felt like a strong level of catharsis in releasing this work. And I know she wanted to for so long. I do think that even though the album feels overdue, I'm so glad I didn't listen to the leaks because it still feels new and fresh. And it is an album with many songs that I'm going to be listening to a whole lot this fall and into the coming year. So there's a lot of good songs on this record. I can't pass it by. It's a shame that pop music is going to kind of just pass it by. You know, it's not going to give it, I think, the props that it deserves because a lot of hard work goes into this. But maybe it's for a good thing. You know, um, when artists have a really successful first album, it's often really difficult and taunting to follow up that success. So don't try so hard. Just make what you want to make instead of something that feels so manufactured and i sense that there's a real true 
person to this album that there is in the, the Duchess, but this feels just a little bit more opened up. Like we can see inside even further. And I appreciate that. I always will. So for some really fun pop songs, though, I definitely recommend this to listen. Um, it has some nice throwback sounds. Again, I think pop music was so much better around the time The Duchess was released. And I like that some of these songs feel a little bit more 2006, 2007, because that's when I got really into pop music. And I'm not so crazy about like the Chainsmokers sound that's just permeating pop music right now. So it, I like that throwback. And then, of course, the 90s hip hop, which I also really do love, you know, Missy Elliott, that kind of sound. So for all those things, I definitely give it some good ratings. It's got some weaknesses, but, you know, hey, let me know what you guys thought and I will see you in the next review. Thanks for watching. Bye.